JP, speaking as an old brain scientist, the question of consciousness, uh, spirit, soul, has always been a real fascination to me. You bet. I have seen over the past few decades a migration away from the traditional belief in the immortality of the soul, even among Christian philosophers. What do you make of that? I think a lot of it's sociological. I think we live in a day uh, where scientism is the default position by a lot of people. That's the idea that science and science alone can give us answers to our questions about reality. And I think it's a big mistake uh, to advance that view. So you believe that there is an immortal soul? Yes, and I think more important to your question, I don't think the issue is scientific. Uh, the fundamental questions about the nature of consciousness and whether there is a soul are just not scientific questions. They're questions like, what exactly is a thought? What is a semantic meaning? Uh, what method should we use? Should we go from the first person to the third person or from the third person to so the first person? So you're arguing person? that those philosophical issues are not scientific questions. That's right. In fact, there hasn't been a single discovery in neuroscience or any other branch of science that a dualist, that is one who believes in the soul and consciousness, could not easily accommodate within his theory or okay. her theory. I want to now explore your arguments in depth. I want to stick on the kinds of arguments that you believe support an immortal soul. So let's start at the beginning. Let's start with consciousness. How do you define consciousness? Consciousness is what you're aware of when you introspect. And just like water can be in three states, liquid, solid, and gas, there are at least five states of consciousness. There are sensations like emotions or awarenesses of red. Uh, there are thoughts, there are beliefs, there are desires like a desire for ice cream. And then there are volitions or acts of will. Uh, consciousness is what happens to you when you wake up from anesthesia. You've been operated on, all of a sudden you begin to feel a throb in your knee, you begin to hear people talking, you desire some, something to drink, you begin to think, where am I? And then you get in touch with your belief that you've been sick. Uh, these are all states of consciousness. Now, now, Robert, here's what's interesting. The very definition of consciousness has to be ostensive. That is, you cannot define consciousness without pointing to examples of it. And Defining consciousness requires first-person introspective ostension. That is, if someone's not conscious, you can't characterize it for them. And if they are conscious, they know what a thought or a feeling of pain is simply by introspecting and being aware of the state itself. Now, what is the difference between a so-called property dualist and a substance dualist, which I suspect you are? A property dualist says that consciousness is different than the properties of the brain, but the brain is what has consciousness. A substance dualist agrees that consciousness isn't physical, and the container of consciousness is not the brain, it's the self or the ego or the soul. Now you might ask, well, how do we know consciousness is different from a brain state? Now here's basically how we know it. There are things true of conscious states that aren't true of physical states, so they can't be the same thing. Let me give you an illustration. Thoughts are either true or false. But no brain state is either true or false. Uh, again, a thought can't be located closer to my left ear or my right ear, but the brain state that's going on while I'm having a thought is located in a region of the brain. It has a shape and a size, but the thought itself doesn't. Thoughts have intentionality. They're of things, but no material state of the brain is of anything. Now, this argument is one for property dualism as well as for substance dualism. It is. So it is not a, a, a necessary claim that there is some independent substance. You can be That's a property right. a dualist and believe everything you just Absolutely. said. Absolutely. So far, if my argument works, what that shows is that consciousness is Different. not physical, but it doesn't say anything about what contains consciousness. Okay. Now, a substance dualist is going to define the soul as an immaterial substance that contains consciousness and animates and makes the body living. And a substance dualist is going to go on and say that not only is consciousness different than the states of the brain, but that conscious mental states are contained in the I or the self or the ego, whereas the brain states that are going on are contained in the brain. So if I'm stuck by a pin, there will be C fibers firing in my brain, but there will be a feeling of pain in the self and they're in causal interaction with one another. They are in causal interaction. Absolutely, both ways. If I choose to raise my arm, I can cause states to occur in my brain. If you uh, stick me with a pin, the brain state will cause a feeling of pain in, in the self.
So what do you do then with the neural correlates of consciousness, which many brain scientists are now uh, working on and are revealing more and more of? So I think that neuroscientific correlations are exactly what the dualists would expect. I mean, after all, uh, dualists don't think that when you're praying or when you're thinking about something, your brain pops out of existence. There are things going on in your brain while things are going on in your mind. And there are very important and detailed correlations between the two. But correlation and identity does not make. Yeah, and everybody agrees with that. Okay, let's now assume this position and try to understand more what it means. Now, are there different kinds of substance dualists or all you guys are the same? Well, we're, there are different versions of substance dualism. There's a version that Descartes advanced, which basically says that the the soul is essentially conscious, and it simply has a causal relationship to the body. The body can cause things to the soul and vice versa. Uh, Thomistic dualism says that the soul goes beyond consciousness and also contains life or animates the body. So on that view, the soul doesn't just causally interact with the body, it also informs or animates or makes the body human in, in the human case. So it's a broader view. It's a much broader view. And they both agree, though, on the fundamental reasons sure. for why there is a soul in the first place. Sure. Let's deal with some of the objections to substance dualism and see how we handle it. Let's start with the philosophical ones. The main argument is, is that how can you have non-physical stuff interacting with physical stuff? There's a, a logical incompatibility. Well, the argument assumes that before A can interact with B, A has to be like B. But that is a contentious assumption, and in fact, it seems patently false. Take the history of science. Newton thought that there was such a thing as absolute space. Uh, Newton said that space was an immaterial substance that was in no way physical, but it could causally interact with matter. Now, whether Newton was right about space doesn't matter. What matters is that his view that space was an immaterial absolute substance that could causally interact with material particles was a view of two things radically different causally interacting with one another, and people did not abandon Newton's view of space because of the problem of causal interaction. They abandoned it for certain empirical reasons. I think we have more evidence that the mind can do things to the brain and conversely that is sufficient to overturn the idea that before X can interact with Y, X has got to be like Y. What, what about uh, the so-called problem of other minds? How do I know that you really are another mind? I know I am, but how do I know about you? I think that is actually evidence for dualism because, in fact, we don't know what's going on in other minds with 100% certainty. Why? Because other minds are only first-person introspectable by that person directly. But I do have derivative knowledge of other minds. I can observe your body movements, your body language. I note an analogy between the two of us. I assume sure. that when you're stuck with a pen and you shout out, the same thing goes on inside of you that goes on in me uh, that I'm introspectively aware of. So we know other minds by, by way of a, a tight a sameness of similarity between your body movements and your composition and me. But that's not a knockdown proof. It's not a knockdown proof, but in fact, I would be suspicious if it were. Mm. Because I know what's in my mind mm. with a degree of epistemic certainty much greater than I know what's in your mind. Right. But if you were your brain or your, uh, or your mm. mental states were brain states, mm. I could in principle know more about what's going on in your mind than you could. <laughs> Let's uh, deal now with the scientific objections to dualism because these, I think, are the more serious ones today. Um, it is certainly true that there are many neuronal correlates of consciousness. I think you've said that you certainly agree with that. Uh, the ones I want you to deal with have to do with the more subtle things, not the parts of the brain that see and hear. You, you can give good analogies of, 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 of how that works. But how about the so-called split brain, um, either experiments or situations where we have human beings who, because of a, a, um, a pathological condition, have had to have their hemispheres <clears throat> separated. And indeed, the experiments show with these people, uh, tragically because they've had some serious problem, that they are really two personalities in the same head. The fact then that there is this further question about how many people are there, is there one or two, shows 
that questions about persons can't be reduced to questions about brains. If they could, there wouldn't be a further question. So the fact that this question can't be resolved by piling further information about the brain is proof that there's more going on in the brain. Secondly, uh, forget brain uh, splitting for a minute. Um, we know that people with multiple personalities, people that are, that are raped as little children, are able at some point to be able to absolutely block off from certain feelings that are going on in their body. And the self has an ability to split off from itself and actually for one part of the self not to be aware of what's going on in another part of the self. So you have a, a traumatized child who can be thinking about playing while they're feeling things in other parts of their body they don't want to be in touch with. So we, we have this general principle that the self is capable of blocking off from its awareness some of its own states, even independent of, the, of split brain phenomena. So I would say that all the split brain phenomena uh, do is introduce further evidence that the self can be out of touch with different things going on within it if something goes wrong psychologically, or in this case, by way of, of brain states. So you would equate the two, a psychological trauma or a severing of brain tissue as, as uh, a bifurcating or in however many parts this soul uh, just by different, uh, different mechanisms. You would have a bifurcation of functioning within the same unified self. That's right. And by the way, the very same criteria that a person would want to use to say there are two people there, namely there is a unified center of consciousness over here and a unified center of consciousness over there, is the very same criterion that we would use to say there's one person there before the brain, the brain splitting. And so a dualist is going to say, yea, verily, and amen. Those criteria are sufficient to establish that we have a unified self that has its own field of consciousness. Robert, the bottom line is this. Consciousness just isn't the same thing as physical states of the brain, because there are things true of one that aren't the other. And the self is not identical to the brain, because the self is a simple substance that isn't composed of parts. And these questions are not fundamentally scientific questions, they're philosophical.